Hello and welcome to this 360 degree virtual reality video tour around the Ards Peninsula and North Down in County Down. We're going to be thinking about Ulster Scots settlers who have made their home in this part of the world for over four centuries now, thinking about their lifestyle, their history, their heritage and their legacy. The scene that you're looking at has been captured in 360 degrees and that means that you can look around with us. You can use your mouse at home or a virtual reality headset. And today we are in the beautiful historic village of Grey Abbey, which sits on the east shores of Strangford Loch. If you look to my left, you'll see a map that shows you where Grey Abbey is. Behind us then stands this magnificent Georgian country home, Grey Abbey House. These were the ancestral lands of Sir Hugh Montgomery a laird from Braidstain in Scotland, who was granted land here in the early 1600s by King James, the sixth of Scotland, the first of England. If you look to my left and to my right, you'll see portraits of Sir Hugh Montgomery and King James. Now these lands back at that period had been decimated by fire and by war. So now Sir Hugh wanted to make a success of the lands in Ulster. So he brought across new tenants from Scotland. These were people who would pay him rent. They would farm the land and establish new villages. They would be loyal to the king. They would speak English and they would establish Protestantism in this area. This exact site where we're standing had formerly been the grounds of an old ecclesiastical foundation, the Grey Abbey, which dated from the late 1100s. If you look to my left and to my right, you'll see some lovely old postcards of the Abbey. So Sir Hugh gave these lands to his son, Sir James Montgomery, who built a house here. Just down beside me is the only stone that remains from that first home. It burnt down as did his second home. So this beautiful building behind me is actually the third house on this estate. It dates from 1762. This was the home of Sir James Montgomery, but now it's the home of Bill Montgomery. And I'm delighted that Bill, who's descended from this illustrious line, has welcomed us to his house and gardens. Thank you, Bill. Lolly, you're hugely welcome. It's a great treat to have you here. Thank you so much. Now, this is a very impressive family of yours, and much of what we know about them comes from a document called the Montgomery Manuscripts. Can you tell us something about that, please? The Montgomery Manuscripts were put together and edited by another William Montgomery, who lived here at the end of the 17th century. And not only are they a vital and important description of life at the time of the early settlement, but they have the added advantage that William actually knew some of the protagonists. Mm, so a really first-hand account, really? Absolutely, and very important source material for the history of this part of the world. Well, what do we learn about Sir Hugh and his activities in Grey Abbey? Well, Sir Hugh grew up in Lowland Scotland, where his father was a laird, he was educated at Glasgow University. He then went to Holland, where he was further educated, and he then joined the court of the Dutch king and became a courtier there. When his father died, he came back to Scotland and joined the court of King James VI. And when the king became first of England, he accompanied him to Hampton Court. So he was uh, very much uh, a civilised man and a courtier. That's very interesting. And then what do you think prompted him to make the decision to move to Ulster and establish a settlement here? Well, he was first of all very well placed because not only was he a courtier, but he had a younger brother who was also in the court as Dean of Norwich, private chaplain to the King, and mm. later to become Bishop of Derry, and finally, Bishop of Meath. So between the two of them, uh, they were in a strong position to obtain a large grant of land in Northern Ireland, which they did. Do you think they were held in high esteem by the locals here? Well, I, <laughs> we must always remember that 
uh, the triumphant people uh, write the history, and it's not always uh, not a little bit uh, leaning in their favour. But just to quote from the manuscripts, um, he uh, repaired six churches, put Bibles and books of common prayer in all of them, and indeed bells. Uh, he built the harbour at Donaghadee, which of course connected him with Port Montgomery in Scotland. And when he died, uh, his obituary says, he was universally revered and loved, mm. obeyed by the Irish, and much esteemed by Con O'Neill and his followers, but especially by his own tenants and planters, who deeply lamented his loss as their great patron and protector. Oh, so he really made a favourable impression then? I, I think he really was, um, particularly if you were a lowland Scot. Yes. Well, tell me, Bill, do you have any artefacts or mementos or anything which brings us back to the early 1600s? We do indeed. Come inside with me and we'll have a look. Thanks very much. Grey Abbey House is considered to be one of the most beautiful Georgian country homes in Ireland. And look at this magnificent room where Bill has brought us now. Strawberry Hill Gothic, it's an octagonal room with marvellous ornate plaster work on the ceiling and logs crackling in the Kilkenny marble fireplace. A beautiful room, Bill. Thank you for welcoming us here. Wow, Lolly, as always, you're hugely welcome. Thank you. You've some very interesting objects laid out to show us here. What's this one, first of all? This, Lolly, is an indenture between the Earl of Eglinton, who is Head Montgomery in Scotland, and Sir Hugh Montgomery, who by then had become Viscount Montgomery of the Greater Ards, and later was to become Earl Mount Alexander. And it grants to Sir Hugh uh, the rights of being top Montgomery in Ireland, uh, and um, in return, he was, if demanded, to provide a stallion, which is illustrated here, um, so uh, there we are. Well, I see some other illustrations on here. Is one of those drawings at the top Sir Hugh himself? Uh, Sir Hugh's the one on the right, and the one on the left is the Earl of Eglinton. And you can see both their crests. Uh, Sir Hugh's is a hand holding a fleur de lis, while Lord Eglinton's is a lady with an anchor over her shoulder holding a severed head in one of her hands. Okay, well now, mention of a severed head reminds me of a story you once told me relating to a recipe or a household tip in this old book. I've, here's the recipe book, and as well as being filled uh, with useful recipes, uh, which start with familiar things like take two dozen eggs and a bottle of brandy uh, uh, the, to begin a cake. But more interesting to me is there's some household hints, including one which is a cure for fits in children. Okay. And it goes, take the skull of a man that has newly died, clean well, and place in an oven that is hot from baking. When the brain has dried to powder, store the powder in a sealed jar and keep the skull. That's the important thing. <laughs> Got to keep the skull. On the onset of a fit, boil a portion of the skull and dissolve in the water two spoonfuls of the powder and administer the potion as a drink. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Um, I think if I was faced with that, I'd never have a fit again. <laughs> no, nor me neither. Do you think perhaps they might have kept powdered brain in this little object, or what's this, Bill? <laughs> I, this would be good to think to keep the powder in, wouldn't it? Yes. It's actually a little silver box or, or container which was given to Sir James Montgomery of Rosemount from Lord Hugh, Viscount of the Arts, 
and he was Sir James's father, and gave him this estate, uh, so that uh, that's how this came into my part of the family. And tell me the story of how you acquired this little silver box. Well, it was a, a very happy accident because I was alerted to the fact that it was going to be sold at auction in London, and I was too late. The gavel had already fallen, and the lot had gone, and I discovered that it had been bought by a London silversmith. And I wrote to him, and he wrote back a lovely letter saying it's quite clear that this box should be at Grey Abbey. I'll let you have it for the sum I paid for it. And I gratefully accepted and sent him a considerable amount of wine and thanks. <laughs> which I'm sure he appreciated. It's lovely, that these objects, which bring us right back to the 17th century and the rival of the Ulster Scots with Sir Hugh Montgomery are here in the proper place. Yes. Do you think there's much else remaining of Sir Hugh Montgomery? Is his legacy still apparent in this part of County Down? I think it definitely is. He arrived uh, with these industrious London Scots. Uh, agriculture in this part of the world been mainly just grazing cattle and uh, farming as we know it didn't exist. And, uh, it's recorded that Sir Hugh built both windmills and watermills. In fact, we've got, still got a windmill and a watermill on the estate or the remains of them. And of course, he enclosed the land, and they, being Scots, they grew oats. And, that's one of the reasons why when the Great Famine appeared in the 1840s, it was not so severe in this part of the world because farming wasn't a monoculture. They were already growing oats, so they could have uh, porridge and oat and bread and oat cakes and everything else. That's a, a really wonderful and important, significant legacy. Thank you so much, Bill for sharing all of this information with us and showing us the ongoing influence of those early Ulster Scots settlers in this area under your great predecessor. I hope you have enjoyed this virtual visit to Grey Abbey. Maybe now you'll be inspired to come here yourself. You can go online, you can find Grey Abbey House and Gardens on the website. Perhaps you'd like to take a last look around this glorious room and maybe join us in some further episodes in this series. Thank you.